All right. Hey, guys. All right. So we are going to pick back up with our To Kill a Mockingbird reading, and we will be looking at Chapter 9. Now, Chapter 9 is extremely important because this is where Scout, our narrator, really starts to understand the gravity of what is going to be taking place in Part 2. And that is this trial um, of Tom Robinson, right? Her dad, Atticus, is um, one of the only attorneys in Maycomb, and he was the one that uh, decided to, or the, the Judge Taylor decided, um, would defend Tom Robinson. Now, remember, Tom Robinson is the um, older black man who is accused of raping May Ella, who is a young white woman, and the Yule family, which we've already been talking about the Yule family uh, and what they're like as people. Okay, so we will be looking at uh, chapter nine, which is kind of broken into two parts. One, we have Scout kind of um, coming to terms with the trial at school when a kid is making fun of her and um, for being a part of the Finch family. And then also the gravity of um, what Atticus is facing uh, with his family defending a black man. Okay. So she says, and remember, um, there are racial slurs in the text. I will never say the racial slur, but it is um, important context that we remember that this was set in the 1930s uh, where this language was used often. OK. All right. You can just take that back, boy. This order was given to me to, um, by me to Cecil Jacobs was the beginning of a rather thin time for Jim and me. My fists were clenched and I was ready to let fly. Atticus had promised me he would wear me out if he ever heard me fighting anymore. I was far too old and too big for such childish things, and the sooner I learned to hold in, the better off everybody would be. I soon forgot. Cecil Jacobs made me forget. He had announced in the schoolyard the day before that Scout Finch's daddy defended Benz. I denied it, but told Jim. What he mean saying that? I asked. Nothing, Jim said. Ask Atticus. He'll tell you. Do you defend ends, Atticus? I asked him that evening. Of course I do. And don't say end, Scout. That's common. It's what everybody at school says. From now on, it'll be everybody less one. Well, if you don't want me growing up talking that way, why do you send me to school? My father looked at me mildly, amusement in his eyes. Despite our compromise, my campaign to avoid school had continued in one form or another since my first day's dose of it. The beginning of last September had brought on sinking spells, dizziness, and mild gastric complaints. I went so far as to pay a nickel for the privilege of rubbing my head against the head of Miss Rachel Cook's son, who was afflicted with a tremendous ringworm. It didn't take. All right, so she is uh, desperately trying to um, get out of going to school. But I was just wonder. but I was wearing another bone. Do all lawyers defend Negroes, Atticus? Of course they do, Scout. Then why did Cecil say you defended ends? He made it sound like you were running a steal. Atticus sighed. I'm simply defending a Negro. His name is Tom Robinson. He lives in that little settlement beyond the town dump. He's a member of Calpurnia's church, and Cal knows his family well. She says they're clean living folks. Scout, you aren't old enough to understand some things yet, but there has been some high talk around town to the effect that I shouldn't do much to, about defending this man. It's a peculiar case, and it won't come uh, to trial until some recession. John Taylor was kind enough to give us a pro postponement. Well, if you shouldn't be defending him, then why are you doing it? For a number of reasons, said Atticus. The main one is, if I didn't, I couldn't hold my head up in town. I couldn't represent this county in the legislature, and I couldn't even tell you and Jim not to do something again. You mean, if you didn't defend that, that man, Jim and me wouldn't have to mind you anymore? That's about right. Why? Because I could never ask you to mind me again. Scout, simply by the nature of the work, every lawyer gets at least one case in his lifetime that affects him personally. This one's mine, I guess. You might hear some ugly talk about it at school, but do one thing for me, if you will. Just hold your head high and keep your fists down. No matter what anybody says to you, don't ever let them get your goat. Try fighting with your head for a change. It's a good one, even if it does resist learning. Atticus, are you going to win it? No, honey. Then why? 
simply because we were licked 100 years before we started. There's no reason for us not to try to win it, Atticus says. It's a very, very important, um, important statement that Atticus is saying. Atticus knows he's going to lose this trial, right? It is a black man's word against a white man's word. Um, Atticus knows, knows this, right? But he is still going to defend him anyway. You sound like Cousin Ike Finch, I said. Cousin Ike Finch uh, was Maycomb County's sole surviving Confederate veteran. He wore a General Hood type beard, which of which um, he was inordinately vain. At least once a year, Atticus, Jim, and I called on him, and I would uh, have to kiss him. It was horrible. Jim and I would listen respectively to Atticus and Cousin Ike rehash the war. Tell you, Atticus, Cousin Ike would say, the Missouri Compromise was what licked us. If I had to go through it again, I'd walk every step of the way there and every step back just like I had done. And furthermore, they'd whip me this time. Now, in 1864, when Stonewall Jackson came by, I beg your pardon, young folks. Old blue light was in heaven, then God rest his saintly brow. Come here, Scout, said Atticus. I crawled into his lap and tucked my head under his chin. I put my arms. He put his arms around me and rocked me gently. It's different this time, he said. This time, we aren't fighting the Yankees. We're fighting our friends. But remember this, no matter how bitter things get, they're still our friends, and this is still our home. It's very powerful, very powerful. With this in mind, I faced Cecil Jacobs in the schoolyard the next day. You're going to take that back, boy. You got to make me first, he yelled. My folks said your dad is disgrace, and that inn ought to hang from the water tank. I drew a bead on him and remember what Atticus had said, and then dropped my fist and walked away. Scout a cow word ringing in my ears. It was the first time I ever walked away from a fight. Somehow, if I fought Cecil, I would not I would let Atticus down. Atticus so rarely asked Jim and me to do something for him, and I I could take that being called a coward for him. I felt extremely noble for having remembered and remained noble for three weeks. Then Christmas came, and disaster struck. Jim and I viewed Christmas with mixed feelings. The good side was the tree and Uncle Jack Finch. Every Christmas Eve day, we met Uncle Jack at Maycomb Junction, and he would spend a week with us. A flip of the coin revealed the uncompromising liniments of Aunt Alexandra and Francis. I suppose I should include Uncle Jimmy and Alexandra's husband, but as he never spoke a word to me in my life except to say, get off the fence once, I never saw any reason to take notice of him. Neither did Aunt Alexandra. Long ago, in a burst of friendliness, Auntie and Aunt Jimmy produced a son named Henry, who left home as soon as, as humanly possible, married and produced Francis. Mary and his wife deposited Francis at my grandparents every Christmas and then pursued their own pleasures. No amount of sighing could induce Atticus to let us spend Christmas Day at home. We went to the Finch's Landing every Christmas in my memory. The fact that Auntie was a good cook was some compensation for being forced to live a religious holiday, um, to spend a religious holiday with Francis Hancock. All right, so Francis Hancock is her cousin. He was a year older than I, and I avoided him on the principle. He enjoyed everything I disapproved of and disliked my ingenious diversions. Aunt Alexandra was Atticus's sister. But when Jim told me about the changelings and siblings, I decided that she had been swapped at birth and that my grandparents had perhaps received a Crawford instead of a Finch. All right, that's talking about Stephanie Crawford and how she's the town gossip. Had I ever harbored the mystical notions about mountains that seemed to obsess lawyers and judges, Aunt Alexandra would have been um, analogous to Mount Everest. Throughout my early life, she was cold in there. All right, so Aunt Alexandra is not that great of a character. When Uncle Jack jumped down from the Christmas train, or on the train Christmas Eve, we had to wait for the porter to hand him two long packages. Jim and I always thought it was funny when Uncle Jack pecked Atticus on the cheek. We were the only, they were the only two men we had ever saw kiss each other. And again, this is showing us the, the time period. 
Uncle Jack shook hands with Jim and swung me high, but not high enough. Uncle Jack was a head shorter than Atticus, the baby of the family. He was younger than Aunt Alexandra. He and Auntie looked alike, but Uncle Jack made better use of his face. We were never weary of the sharp, weary of his sharp nose and chin. He was one of the few men of science who never terrified me, probably because he never behaves like a doctor. Wherever he performed a minor service for Jim and me, as removing a splinter from a foot, he would he would tell us what exactly what he was going to do, give us an estimation of how much it would hurt, and explain the use of any tongs he employed. One Christmas, I lurked in the corners, nursing a twisted splinter in my foot, permitting no one to come near me. When Uncle Jack caught me, he kept me laughing about a preacher who hated going to church so much that every day he stood at his gate in his dressing gown, smoking a hookah, and delivering five-minute sermons to a passerby who desired spiritual comfort. I interrupted to make Uncle Jack let me know when he would pull it out. But he held up a bloody splinter in the pair of tweezers and said he yanked it out while I was laughing. And that was what was known as relativity. <laughs> What's in those packages? I asked him, pointing at the long, thin parcels the porter had given him. None of your business, he said. Jim said, how's Rose Alamer? Rose Alamer was Uncle Jack's cat. She's a beautiful yellow female, Uncle Jack said, was one of the few women he could stand permanently. He reached into his coat pocket and brought out snapshots. We admired them. She's getting fat, I said. I should think so. She eats all the leftover fingers and ears from the hospital. Oh, that's a damn story, I said. I beg your pardon. Atticus said, don't pay any attention to her, Jack. She's trying it out. Cal says she's been cussing fluently for a week now. Uncle Jack raised his eyebrows and said nothing. I was proceeding on the dim theory, aside from the innate attractiveness of such words, that if Atticus discovered I had picked them up at school, he wouldn't make me go. So Scout's only cussing because she's thinking maybe that Atticus won't let her drop out of school. But at the supper that evening, when I asked him to pass the damn ham, please, Uncle Jack pointed at me and said, see me after, young lady, he said. When supper was over, Uncle Jack went to the living room and sat down. He slapped his thighs for me to come sit on his lap. I liked to smell him. He was like a bottle of alcohol and something pleasantly sweet. He pushed back my bangs and looked at me. You're like Atticus. You're more like Atticus than your mother, he said. You're also growing out of your pants a little. I reckon they fit all right. You like words like damn and hell now, don't you? I said I reckon so. Well, I don't, said Uncle Jack. Not unless there's extreme provocation connected with them. I'll be here and I'll I'll be here a week, and I don't want to hear any words like that while I'm here. Scout, you'll get in trouble if you go around saying things like that. You want to grow up and be a lady, don't you? I said not particularly. Of course you do. Now let's get to the tree. We decorated the tree before until bedtime, and that night I dreamed of the two long packages for Jim and me. Next morning, Jim and I dived for them, and they were from Atticus, who had written Uncle Jack to get them for us, and they were what we had asked for. Don't point them at the house, said Atticus. When Jim aimed at a picture on the wall, you'll have to teach him to shoot, said Uncle Jack. That's your job. I merely bowed to the inevitable. So this is an important um, little key detail, little another Easter egg that Harper Lee is foreshadowing, um, showing us that Atticus is a good shooter. Okay. I took Atticus's courtroom voice to drag us away from the tree. He declined to let us take our air rifles to the landing. Uh, I had already begun to think of shooting Francis. <laughs> Instead, we made one false move. He'd take them away from us for good. Finch's landing consisted of 366 steps down a high bluff and ending in a jetty. Farther down the stream, beyond the bluff, were traces of an old cotton landing where Finch Negroes had loaded bales and produce, unloaded blocks of ice, flour and sugar, farm equipment, and feminine apparel. A two-rut road ran from the riverside and vanished among the dark trees. At the end of the road was a two-storied white house with porches circling its upstairs and downstairs. In his old age, our ancestor, Simon Finch, had built it to please his nagging wife. 
but the porch is all resemblance, um, all resemblance to ordinary houses of its era ended. The internal arrangement of the Finch house was indicative of Simon's guilelessness and was absolute trust with which he regarded his offspring. There were six bedrooms, four of the eight female children, uh, four for the eight female children, one for the welcome Finch, the sole son, and, the, and one for visiting relatives. Simple enough, but the daughter's rooms could only be reached by one staircase, welcome's room and the guest room only by another. The daughter's staircase was in the ground floor bedroom of their parents, so Simon always knew the hours of his daughter's nocturnal comings and goings. There was a kitchen separate from the rest of the house, and tacked onto it was a wooden catwalk. In the backyard was a rusty bell on a pole used to summon the field hands or as a distress signal. A widow's walk was on the roof and no windows walked there, but no widows walked there. From it, Simon oversaw his overseer, watched the river boats and gazed into the lives of surrounding landowners. There went with the house the unusual legends about the Yankees. One fish female recently engaged donned her complete trusted so to save it from the raiders in the neighborhood. She became stuck in the door uh, to the daughter's staircase, but was doused with water and finally pushed through. So that's a little bit of just history about physically where they're going. When we arrived at the landing, Aunt Alexandra kissed Uncle Jack. Francis kissed Uncle Jack. Uncle Jimmy shook hands silently with Uncle Jack. And Jim and I gave our presents to Francis, who gave us a present. Jim felt his age and gravitated towards the adults, leaving me to entertain our cousin. Francis was eight sl and slicked back with his hair. What'd you get for Christmas? I asked politely. Just what I asked for, he said. Francis had requested a pair of knee pants, a red leather book sack, five shirts, and an untied bow tie. That's nice, I lied. Jim and I got air rifles. And Jim got a chemistry set. A toy one, I reckon. No, a real one. He's going to make some invisible ink and I'm going to write to Dill in it. Dill asked, what was the use of that? Well, can't you just see his face when he gets a letter from me with nothing in it? It'll drive him nuts. Talking to Francis gave me the sensation of settling slowly to the bottom of the ocean. He was the most boring child I ever met. He lived in Mobile, and he could not inform me on the school authority. He could not inform on me to school authorities, but he managed to tell me everything he knew to Aunt Alexandra, who in turn unburdened herself to Atticus, who either forgot it or gave me hell, whichever struck his fancy. But the only time I ever heard Atticus speak sharply to anyone was when I once heard him say, Sister, I do the best I can with them. It had something to do with my going around in overalls. Aunt Alexandra was fanatical on the subject of my attire. I could not possibly hope to be a lady if I wore breeches. When I said I could do nothing in a dress, she said I wasn't supposed to be doing things that required pants. Aunt Alexandra's vision of my deportment devolved, involved playing with small stoves, tea sets, and wearing an add a pearl necklace uh, she gave me when I was born. Furthermore, I should be a ray of sunshine in my father's lonely life. I suggested that one could be a ray of sunshine in pants just as well, but Auntie said that one had to behave like a sunbeam and that I was born good but had progressively have grown progressively worse every year. She hurt my feelings and I had set my teeth permanently on edge. And when I asked Atticus about it, he said there were already enough sunbeams in the family and to go about my business. Go on about my business. He didn't mind me much the way I was. At Christmas dinner, I sat at the little table in the dining room. Jim and uh, Francis sat with the adults at the dining table. Auntie had continued to isolate me long after Jim and Francis graduated to the big table. I often wondered what she thought I do get up and throw something. I sometimes thought of asking her if she would let me sit at the big table with the rest of them just once. I would prove to her how civilized I could be. After all, I ate at home every day with no major mishaps. When I begged Atticus to use his influence, he said he had none. 
We were guests. And when we sat where and we sat where she told us to sit. He also said Aunt Alexandra didn't understand the girls much. She had never had one. But her cooking made up for everything. Three kinds of meat, summer vegetables, vegetables from her pantry shelves, peach pickles, two kinds of cakes, and ambrosia consisted of modest Christmas dinner. Afterwards, the adults made for the living room and sat around in a dazed condition. Jim laid on the floor and I was I went to the backyard. Put on your coat, said Atticus dreamingly. So I didn't hear him. <laughs> Francis sat beside me on the back steps. That was the best yet, I said. Grandma's a wonderful cook, said Francis. She's going to teach me how. Boys don't cook. I giggled at the thought of Jim in an apron. Again, that's that, that sexism. That's part of that culture. Grandma says all men should learn to cook and that men ought to be careful with their wives and wait on them when they don't feel good, said my cousin. I don't want Dill waiting on me, I said. I'd rather wait on him. Dill? Yeah, don't say anything about it, but we're going to get married as soon as we're big enough. He asked me last summer. Francis hooted. What's the matter with him, I asked. Ain't, ain't anything the matter with him. You mean that little runt Grandma says stays with Miss Rachel every summer? That's exactly who I mean. I know all about him, said Francis. What about him? Grandma says he hasn't got a home. He has two. He lives in Meridian. He just gets passed around from relative to relative. And Miss Rachel keeps him every summer. Francis, that's not so. Francis grinned at me. You're mighty duns, dumb sometimes, Jean Louise. Guess you, do, you don't know any better, though. What do you mean? If Uncle Jack lets you run around with stray dogs, that's his own business. Like Grandma says. So it ain't your fault. I guess it ain't your fault if Uncle Atticus is an in lover besides. But I'm here to tell you it certainly doesn't mortify the rest of the family. Francis, what the hell do you mean? Just what I said. Grandma said it's bad enough he lets you all run wild. But now he turned out to be an in lover and will never be able to walk the streets of make him again. He's ruining the family. That's what he's doing. Francis rose and sprinted down the catwalk to the old kitchen. At a safe distance, he called, he is nothing but an in lover. He is not, I roared. And I don't know what you're talking about, but you better cut it out this red hot minute. I leaped off the steps and ran down the catwalk. It was easy to, to call her Francis. I said, take it back quick. Francis jerked loose and sped into the old kitchen. In lover, he yelled. When stalking one's prey, it's best to take one's time. Say nothing, and as sure as eggs, he will he will become curious and emerge. Francis appeared at the kitchen window. You still mad, June Louise? He asked tentatively. Nothing to speak of, I said. Francis came out of the catwalk. You gonna take a back, Francis? I was so quick. I was too quick on the draw. Francis shot back into the kitchen, so I retired to the steps. I could wait patiently. Uh, I had to, I had sat there perhaps five minutes when I heard Aunt Alexandra speak. Where's Francis? He's out yonder in the kitchen. He knows he's not supposed to play in there. Grandma cannot, uh, Francis came out the door and yelled, Grandma, she's got me in here. She won't let me out. What is all of this, Jean Louise? I looked at Aunt Alexandra. I hadn't got him in there, Auntie. I ain't holding him. Yes, she is, shouted Francis. She won't let me out. Have you all been fussing? Jean, Jean Louise got mad at me, Grandma, called Francis. Francis, come out of there. Jean Louise, if I hear another word out of you, I'll tell your father. Did I hear you say hell a while ago? No, ma'am. I thought I did. I better not hear it again. Aunt Alexandra was a back porch listener. The moment she was out of sight, Francis came up and head, came out head up and greeting. Don't you fool with me, he said. He jumped into the yard and kept his disking, kicking tufts of grass and turning um, around occasionally to smile at me. Jim appeared on the porch and looked at us and went away. Francis climbed the mimosa tree, came down and put his hands in his pockets and strolled around the yard. Ha, he said. I asked him who he thought he was, Uncle Jack. Francis said he better, he reckoned I'd got told for me to just sit there and leave him alone. I ain't bothering you, I said. Francis looked at me carefully, concluded that I had been sufficiently subdued, and crooned softly. 
in lover. This time I split my knuckle to the bone in his front teeth. My left impaired and I sailed in with my right, but not for long. Uncle Jack pinned my arms to my sides and said, stand still. Aunt Alexandra ministered to Francis, wiping his tears away with her handkerchief, rubbing his hair and patting his cheek. Atticus Jim and Uncle Jimmy had come to the back porch where Francis started yelling. Who started this? said Uncle Jack. Francis and I pointed at each other. Grandma, he bawled. She called me a whore lady and jumped on me, which is a lie. Is that true, Scout? Uh, said Uncle Jack. I reckon so. When Uncle Jack looked down at me, his features were like Aunt Alexandra's. You know, I told you you'd get in trouble if you were you words like that. I told you, didn't I? Yes, sir. But, well, you're in trouble now. Stay here. I was debating whether to stay there or run and tarried my indecision a moment too long. I turned to flee, but Uncle Jack was quicker. I found myself suddenly looking at a tiny ant struggling with a breadcrumb in the grass. I'll never speak to you again as long as I live. I hate you and despise you and hope you die tomorrow. A statement that seemed to encourage Uncle Jack more than anything. I ran to Atticus for comfort, but he said I had it coming, and it was high time we went home. I climbed into the back seat of the car without saying goodbye to anyone. And at home, I ran to my room and slammed the door. Jim tried to say something nice, but I wouldn't let him. When I surveyed the damage, there were only seven or eight red marks. And I was so reflecting upon relativity when somebody knocked on my door and I asked who it was. Uncle Jack answered, go away. Uncle Jack said if I had talked like, if I talked like that, he'd look me again. So I was quiet. When he entered the room, I retreated to the corner and turned my back to him. Scout, he said, do you still hate me? Go on, please, sir. Why, I didn't think you'd hold it against me, he said. I'm disappointed in you. You had it coming, you know it. Didn't either. Honey, you can't go around calling people. You ain't fair, I said. You ain't fair. Uncle Jack's eyebrows went up. Not fair. How not? You're real nice, Uncle Jack, and I reckon I love you even after what you did, but you don't understand children much. Uncle Jack put his hands on his hips and looked down at me. And why do I not understand children, Miss Jean Louise? Such conduct as yours required little understanding. It was so obstreperous, uh, disorderly, and abusive. You gonna tell me, you gonna give me a chance to tell you? I don't mean to sass you, I'm just trying to tell you. Uncle Jack sat down on the bed. His eyebrows came together, and he peered up at me from under them. Proceed. I took a deep breath. Well, in the first place, you never stopped to give me a chance to tell you my side of it. You were just you just lit right into me. When Jim and I fuss, Atticus doesn't ever just listen to Jim's side of it. He hears mine, too. And in the second place, you told me to never use words like that except in ex extreme provocation. And Francis provocated me enough to knock his block off. Uncle Jack scratched his head. What was your side of it, Scout? Francis called Atticus something, and I wasn't about to take it off of him. What did Francis call him? An end lover? I ain't very sure what it means, but the way Francis said it. I'll tell you one thing right now, Uncle Jack. I'll be... I swear before God, if I sit there and let him say something about Atticus, he called Atticus that? Yes, sir, he did, and a lot more. Said Atticus to be the ruination of the family, and he let Jim and me run wild. From the look on Uncle Jack's face, I thought I was in for it again. When he said, we'll see about this, I knew Francis was in for it. We got a good mind to go out there tonight. Please, sir, just let it go, please. I have no intention of letting it go, he said. Alexandra should know about this. The idea of, wait till I get my hands on that boy. Uncle Jack, please promise me something, please, sir. Promise you won't tell Atticus about this. He, he asked me one time not to let anything I heard about him make me mad. And I'd rather him think we were fighting about something else instead. Please promise. But I don't like Francis getting away with something like this. He didn't. You reckon you could tie my hand? It's still bleeding some. Of course I will, baby. I know of no hand I would be more delighted to tie up. Will you come this way? Uncle Jack 
uh, gallantly bowed me to the bathroom while he cleaned and bandaged my knuckles. He entertained me with a tale about a funny, nearsighted old gentleman who had a cat named Hodge and who counted all the cracks in the sidewalk when he went to town. There now, he said, you'll have a very unladylike scar on your wedding ring finger. Thank you, Uncle Jack. Or thank you, sir. Uncle Jack, ma'am, what's a whore lady? Jack plunged into another long tale about an old prime minister who sat down in the House of the Commons and blew feathers in the air and tried to keep them there when all about him men were losing their heads. I guess he was trying to answer my question, but he made no sense whatsoever. Later, when I was supposed to be in bed, I went down the hall for a drink of water and heard Atticus and Uncle Jack in the living room. I, sh I shall ne never marry Atticus. Why? I might have children. Atticus said, you've got a lot to learn, Jack. I know. Your daughter gave me my first lesson this afternoon. She said I didn't understand children much and, and told me why. She was quite right. Atticus, she told me how I should have treated her. Oh, dear. I'm so sorry I romped on her. Atticus chuckled. She earned it. So don't feel so, too remorseful. I waited on tinter, on tinter hooks for Uncle Jack to tell Atticus my side of it. But he didn't. He simply murder, murmured. Her use of the bathroom and um, invective leaves nothing to the imagination. But... She doesn't know the meaning of half she says. She asked me what a whore lady was. Did you tell her? No. I told her about Lord Melbourne. Jack! Oh, sorry. When a young, uh, when a child asks you something, answer him for God's sake. But don't make a production of it. Children are children, but they can spot an invasion quicker than adults, and an invasion simply muddles them. No, my father mused. You have the right to answer this afternoon but the wrong reasons. Bad language is a stage all children go through and it dies with time. And when they learn, they're not attracting attention with it. Hot headedness isn't. Scout's got to learn to keep her head, uh, to keep her head and learn soon with what's in store for her in these next few months. She's coming along though. Jim's getting older and she follows his, his example a good bit. Um, all she needs is assistance sometimes. Atticus, you never laid a hand on her. I admit that. So far, I've been able to get by with threats. Jack, she minds me as well as she can. She doesn't come up to scratch half the time, but she tries. That's not the answer, said Uncle Jack. No. The answer is she knows I know she tries. That's what makes the difference. What bothers me is that she and Jim will have to absorb some, ug some ugly things pretty soon. I'm not worried about Jim keeping his head, but Scout will just as jump on somebody to look at him if her pride's at stake. I waited for Uncle Jack to break his promise, and he still didn't. Atticus, how bad is it going to be? You hadn't, you haven't had too much chance to discuss it. It couldn't be worse, Jack. The only thing we've got is a black man's word against the Yules. The evidence boils down to you did, I didn't. The jury couldn't possibly be expected to take Tom Robinson's word against the Yules. Are you acquainted with the Yules? Uncle Jack said, yes, he remembered them. He described them to Atticus, but Atticus said, you're a generation off. The present ones are the same, though. What are you going to do then? Before I'm through, I intend to jar the jury a bit. I think we'll have a reasonable chance on appeal, though. I really can't tell at this stage, Jack. You know, I'd hoped to get through life without a case of this kind, but John Taylor um, pointed at me and said, you're it. Let this cut pass from you. Huh? Yeah, but do you think I could face my children otherwise? You know what's going to happen as well as I do, Jack, and I hope and I pray I can get Jim and Scout through it without the bitterness. Most of all, without catching Maycomb's unusual disease. Why reasonable people go stark raving mad when anything involving a Negro comes up is something I don't pretend to understand. I just hope that Jim and Scout come to me for their answers instead of listening to the town. I hope they trust me enough. Jean Louise, my scalp jumped and I stuck my head around the corner. Sir, go to bed. I scurried to my room and went to bed. 
Uncle Jack was a prince of a fellow not to let me down. But I never figured out how Atticus knew I was listening. And it was not until many years later that I realized he wanted me to hear every word that he said. Bye, guys.